Yeah. Okay. Um, let me, we will get the whole panel here and uh, you can ask questions. Uh, since I want the microphone, I get to answer the, ask the first question, uh, not answer. Uh, how many of you have questions for the panelists? Okay. All right, good. So why don't, can we sit here? Uh, in the chair. Okay, in the chair. Yeah, can we sit in the chair? <laughs> all right, so let's get started. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for sharing all the information. It was uh, really great, and e from each one of these presentations, we got a lot more information than you know. We thought we would, and, and the numbers as well as the reasoning why you went is pretty good. Uh, since uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to just ask one, and then I'll open it up for the audience. And if they don't have questions, then I have. So we'll not let you go before. Okay. Let's we'll think of some questions. Um, Are you giving us lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's right. Pal, if you pay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, see, you talked about, the, I think one theme that came across uh, pretty much um, again and again in each one of your presentations is that use a mix of technologies. MySQL, Vertica, you talked about Vertica, which is a common database, you talked about VectorWise. And you said 99.9, .9. I forgot how many nines after the dot, but in MySQL will do the job kind of stuff. And you also start with MySQL and uh, move on to these kinds of things a lot. So I just want each one of you to tell us a little bit about what it was like to go, you know, and did you do any measurements or were you just like breaking down? Uh, how did it happen and then which, see there are all these confusing array of databases, like there were graph databases, this columnar databases, the key value stores, the three or four different types of NoSQL databases, and of course, you know, there is all this Google and Amazon. So, did you look at any of those like cloud based services before making a decision to do it on your own? And you know, just anything that you know that you think of audience should know who uh, wants to focus. Uh, so, I guess I'll answer your last question first, right? So, we are cloud. So we can't really look at other people to give us a cloud, right? Uh, PayPal has been sort of the wallet in the cloud for the last 10 years, even though 10 years ago the word cloud wasn't really used, right? So to us that wasn't an option because you know, our, we feel that our, uh, I guess, use case is big enough and important enough and uh, I guess in-house is the way to go for us, right? Uh, so that said, when we actually started evaluating, we set up a criteria, right? So like I said, we had the criteria of X number of queries when load, 5 million concurrent sort of messages being streamed into the database, right? 2,000 simultaneous queries. So those, those were our sort of benchmarks, right? That's what we tried to evaluate each of these technologies on. And uh, with Oracle, we ran into a limitation at about 15,000 per second. Far cry from five million, right? <laughs> so even when we use sort of the batch interface, so the OCI for actually loading batch files in, now when we compare that numbers-wise to uh, sort of uh, Vertica, it was a magnitude of uh, you know 100 difference in performance. Uh, the columnar database is actually being fast, 100 times faster than actually trying to load this data into uh, or something like Oracle. Uh, so yes, uh, we, we, we had a same, applied the same set of criteria to all of these solutions. And uh, you know, I think the criteria was based on our scale, our sort of internal requirements, I didn't share some of those numbers. But beyond that, I think some part of it is also experience, right? I think some of the, some of the sort of solutions we have ruled out because we know that you know, we've seen it not work before, right? Uh, so that's, for example, things like uh, you know, or operational constraints, right? Not just experience or knowing. In our case, uh, even though we use MySQL for some parts of the site, uh, it's not sort of a technology we widely support from an operational perspective, right? 
Teradata is an appliance that uh, you know, we use on the data warehousing side. We rule that out because from experience we know that the cheapest appliance is going to be you know, X million of dollars for us to actually stand up. So some, some, some things get ruled out by experience, other things we applied actually the same criteria to do an evaluation across the board. I just want to add one thing to that. So, at Zoho, right, we always start out with the open source technologies. So, in fact, somebody, uh, and when we use to, when, when we basically, when we also distribute software, right, it's not just on the cloud, but it's also on premise software. Somebody jokingly told me that if you open up your package, so that the, you know, the managed engine or Zoho package, you find all the open source products in there. So, so, we use and evaluate open source packages a lot. And there are varieties of different segments of customer we sell, right? Right from individual consumers to SMB to large enterprises. And applying the same technology from a cost standpoint doesn't make sense to, you know, if you're going to use an enterprise grade technology for an SMB, you're just going to, the costs are not going to work out. That's primarily why we make the technology decisions of either a MySQL or a Coronet database kind of a decision. So cost is definitely one factor that we I just want to add one thing quickly on the cloud aspect. Uh, we did use a cloud at Tool Iris back then, but that would have definitely made a lot of sense thinking back. A lot of the things that I said around uh, taking three, four days to catch up and so on was because we had to do capacity planning and we were a startup, we could not afford to throw infrastructure at uh, you know, an, an analytics cluster. But with the cloud, you can easily spin up and down instances. And so, you know, catching up would, would have been as simple as you know, spinning 40 or 50 instances on AWS, doing the computation, shutting those instances down, and then going back to your steady state cluster of five instances. That's a very popular model these days. AWS wasn't that popular back then, nor was it, you know, like we would have had to take, uh, in, you know, sort of technology risk with that. The team was not comfortable with that. And so we did not go with it, but that would, that would definitely be the way to go today had, had I, you know, if I do it again. Just uh, wanted the answer to the question, yeah. wanted to answer the question as to why we choose a particular technology, right? I think it's really about your use case. I keep saying this in most of my uh, sessions. You have to uh, sometimes step back and ask yourself, uh, what is my use case, right? So uh, according to that, you can figure out, hey, if you've got a log, uh, a lot of fields. Uh, typically, you can you think, hey, it's a MySQL table, but you shouldn't think of it as a MySQL table. You should think of it as a log. It's a log, and you could do log processing in other systems as well. So, uh, if it's below a certain threshold, if it is a couple of hundred million records, if it is a couple of gigabytes of data, you can sure use MySQL to do the processing as well, right? Like or Oracle, right? Uh, if it is not, if it's gonna, if, if it's gonna be a very large data which can't be managed in a regular database or a regular cluster, then you step back and go out and see, this is my data structure, uh, what other solutions are there which suit my data structure and which I could use for possible processing. You don't go with the fancy that everybody is using NoSQL in the cloud, so let me also jump into that. <laughs> don't do that. Right? So, that's, that's my answer. Okay, so... I don't have a question, but listening to all this, I'm not really a, I'm kind of a, uh, an anomaly here, I'm not really a geek, but I worked a lot with geeks. Uh, okay, so uh, for the question, I actually the suggestion I have is given the fact that this is a very challenging set of decisions, it makes eminent sense for me. I think today this concept of crowdsourcing a book or a resource on choices of technology, I the book which is called the Business Model Generation Workbook, it was done by I think about 470 people or 55 contributors. No, no, there's a business model generation book which is done by about 470 authors. I mean, this may be a good project for us to undertake to see how to choose different technologies uh, based on different criteria because it seems to me that a lot of challenges and if we can have shared learnings, it will be an excellent resource for anybody, including startups or anybody else. Yeah. Somebody had a question. Uh, there are two choices. I can walk up to the mic back and forth. Or so we have to bring it back to that. Um, okay, let's uh... So, I think there are two things, right? One is the big data and the big data analysis. I think Hadoop kind of fits it on the big data analysis part of it. 
Hadoop is actually just a way of accessing HTML or so Hadoop is actually you know a technology which helps you in accessing your big data, right? So I think uh, so those are two different things. And going with that definition of big data, saying you know volume, velocity, and variety. So it's a clear indication, right, that there are certain limitations of a relational database where you cannot support elasticity. Like today you want to support 100 million, you know, and that's just fine. And tomorrow there is a particular hour of the day where you want to support, you know, like crazy 100 times of what the volume you are supporting on a regular basis. And variety again, you know, as the schema issue comes in, so, you know, variety of data keeping on changing or the velocity and volume. So, all of this kind of is it not a very clear indication that if it is actually a big data. So, removing out Hadoop part of it. Hadoop is not just a, you know, it's not a big data solution. Right? It's a way of accessing your big data. So, you can apply MapReduce on your traditional relational, relational database as well. So, the question is like, you know, if you really mean to say that you want to work on big data, so is it actually even possible to use a relational database? Even at the first place. So, or maybe I shouldn't take it since he's one of my colleagues. <laughs> we should talk about it over, right? So, I think I think you're you're right in one sense, right? So, um, the volume, velocity, and the rate of change of data is certainly one aspect, right? I think the other aspect is the type of data. In this sort of the, the data that you're actually talking about, right? So if it's transactional data, say in our case, right? Uh, well, RDBM is still a relevant way to sort of use it, right? But there are different layers of those right? It's not just yep. you know key value or document or file. Absolutely. So you look at what is the type of data you're dealing with, and you know you kind of make a solution. And that's what I was going, right? So you have to look at the data actually and say what solution fits that data best. Correct. Okay. But if it is a big data. Though it is a transactional data, let's say it's a completely transactional system and the volume of data is so huge and the velocity keeps changing and the variety is changing, there is an inbuilt limitation in relational database where it can just vertically scale. You cannot do a horizontal scale. You cannot like plug in an additional hardware just for you know a couple of hours. So looking at that, so I think you said MySQL works in 99.9999 percentage of the time. <laughs> but if it is actually we are talking about a big data. So there are techniques like you know you use sharding and stuff which you try to do with the relational database but going with the pure big data saying you know in terms of what definition we have just discussed it might not be a solution right? there might be a different flavor of NoSQL or you know you want to use instead of Hadoop you want to use a hive to access your data which is a pure analytical system but the data storage part of it because of that relational model of you know not being able to do a vertical scaling it's a, it's a limitation bench. Oh, it, 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 absolutely, it absolutely is, right? And that's why I think sort of how we define big data in today's world is also a misnomer, right? Just the volume of data and velocity of data, right? And you also have to add sort of your data and then say, okay, what solution fits this sort of level of processing, this scale of processing, right? And you're right, you know, sharding is, is, a, is a one way to at least try to scale it horizontally, right? You know, sort of separating out, you know, transactional nodes is one another way to find, even though it's not sort of real charting, right? So there's different ways to sort of skin the cat of scalability in terms of your data velocity, right? Access or change or, or whichever way you want to look at. It. And that's why I think, like like Tom said, the 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 so real thing to look at is the use case and your actual data, right? Like, before you actually jump into the solution. I somehow tend to think that uh, you think that big data is equal to not MySQL or don't use MySQL. Is that what you're trying to say? No, not even. I'm talking about relational database versus a non relational Right. So, so even, in, uh, even if you have 10 billion events and there is a transactional event, obviously it's better that you use a relational database. Yes, you can do techniques like sharding or replication. No, but if the volume of data, let's say, is you, like, you know, you can do 10 million events on MySQL using sharding. Not no 10 million, let's say if it's like TV. 100 billion, no, I'm talking about 10 billion events a month or 100 million. No. You, you could do that. If you cluster, if you just take a MySQL cluster, if you shard it, take the data what you get, you divide it, you know, you segmentize it, saying that a certain data goes only in certain servers, you spread it out. Do the transaction processing and aggregate the results later in a separate database. But elasticity is not good, right? Why not? I want to 
I have put a presentation on SlideShare called, or maybe I haven't, it's called How We Scale. So we have a similar solution where we said that hey, the transactions are going up, we can actually on the fly initiate kind of, there's a pre-installed MySQL instance, but we initiate the database, we, we put that into the data processing cluster and the transactions start like next minute. So we do have, we, we've done something with that, it's doable, a lot of people have done that. There's a very interesting presentation uh, on uh, highscalability.com uh, which says uh, 10,000 databases per minute, a very unorthodox approach to database uh, scalability and design. How look at that? It probably answers your question. Uh, just to quickly add to that, I think it really comes down to uh, more than the type of data to what is the question you are trying to answer that will dictate which technology or framework or etc. that you use. On your specific question, no SQL versus SQL, it's possible uh, to use MySQL itself as a no SQL data store, which is how Facebook uses it. And uh, a friendly uses it, for example, friendly has a complete architecture on how they use MySQL as a no SQL. Uh, data store obviously MySQL has better uh, better suited to relational data, but you can also use it as an OSQL data store. Um, that said, all I want to say is that you run into the same limitations um, that you face with MySQL and sharding and so on, even with some system like Hadoop. I'll give you an example. You know, at our company, we had to do a lot of uh, analytics on how many unique users we were, we were getting. Right, that's an important metric in the web space and so on. And it turns out, at least back then, that if you want to do a, a distinct on you know a set of data and so on. Uh, in the reduced space of Hadoop, uh, uh, it, ha it has to memory on one machine, right? Uh, if you were not doing anything special, and then you would run out of memory space in that machine, and you would not be able to do this distinct, even on even on a distributed system. So you run into these limitations. So, so then we had to take care of you know uh, sharding and such that we could do uniques across different groups and on different machines, and then just becomes a question of summing up those. Uh, individual bucket. So you're going to run into these kinds of limits whether you use SQL, or MySQL, or Hadoop by any of the systems. It's a question of how you work around those limitations. Uh, well, I would like to add one more uh, thing here. <coughs> Basically, when you actually do the big data architecture, right, you need to first split it up. First thing is you store the transactions. The second thing is you build the warehouse on top of it. And third thing is you build models on top of the warehouse. Okay, so for the basic transaction capturing or doing everything, MySQL does the job. Okay, like Asif said, 100 billion data doesn't matter. But when you want to run a small aggregated query with three joins or four joins, that's where it gets struck. Okay, that's the reason why you need to use Hive or BigQuery or whatever, where you columnize the data and if you want to aggregate the results, it just gets you in milliseconds or seconds. And that solves the problem. And you pass this aggregated data towards the models and it gives you real time solutions. Even with the okay. database, can we want to do it? So, can we? Can we? We don't know. We'll. Can I start? So, I think uh, so we are, we're looking at the same problem from different angles, right? I think you're both right in sort of your perspective. I think from, uh, from uh, sort of both of us sharing the knowledge about the PayPal system, I think our, our view is a little sort of colored a certain way about the transactional system, right? And that's different from what, how an analytic system works, right? In a transactional system, we don't try to sort of aggregate things. Right? It's more about actually, you know, running the transaction or getting data for a particular row in that entire data set, right? Or a set of related rows in the data set. And each individual row represents a different data set, right? So, there, there are sort of differences because of the type of data in how a transactional system uh, should be should be handled versus an analytic system should be handled. Right? But again, even in a transactional system, right? There's uh, like Asya was saying, there's ways to sort of cluster your data sources. There's like you said, there's ways to shard your data sources, right? And there's umpteen ways to actually you know scale your data out. But the one important point, I think that sort of uh, we are mixing in with the concern of transactionality is consistency. Right? It's if you require strict consistency, right, then you run into the problem of I can only scale vertically. Right? If you move to a model of sort of eventual consistency, then you have loser constraints and you can actually have more solutions around how you horizontally scale the data set. Right? Uh, so I think that's really the one piece I thought that was missing from, from the discussion. Okay, we'll, we'll come back actually after we finish a couple of questions because I didn't want to cut it out. But, so, if you want to go. 
Uh, we'll, we'll take like two questions and then we'll take the mic back um, so that we can get answered. Hello. <laughs> so I actually have a few technical questions for everyone, so I'm only allowed two questions. I'm not going to do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to stick to a more business uh, kind of problem uh, here. Um, so what sort of opportunities, since all of you have experience in big data uh, uh, to some degree and evolution toward big data at some point, what sort of uh, opportunities do you see for new startups to uh, address problems in the area? And uh, you know, uh, where do you think, like, if you had like a certain application or a certain uh, type of platform uh, or pretty much anything out there that uh, could help you uh, do your jobs better or faster or easier? That is two questions. No, I have more like twenty questions. Okay. I think the fundamental opportunity is that uh, there are very few folks who understand how to process very large amounts of data. So uh, I think this business is somewhat exploding in the US right now. There are companies. So there are different kinds of people doing different things. Uh, there is Cloudera actually having their own Hadoop stack, and that's pretty complicated. But I have friends who are offering Hadoop as a service. Uh, so they will host it and manage it on an Amazon cloud. And they will handle those issues and downtimes and provide an SLA, which is pretty straightforward. But providing that as a service, so billable by the hour, uh, by the amount of data that they handle. So that's an opportunity which is very generated. And each industry has massive opportunities. So I think in analytics, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in advertising, data modeling. Becoming more and more common as an opportunity. So it, I think it's it's really huge. It's just data. I, I would hate to call it big data, but I, I think it's just the data opportunity itself is pretty wide. Big data is when the data size becomes so large that can be managed to conventional ways, right? So if you look at the personal data phenomena, what uh, Nike Rocket uh, Fuel, what is that? Nike Fuel, right? Nike Fuel and uh, Fitbit. These guys are basically trying to track your uh, everyday activity. And that's supposed to be a really huge opportunity. There's a new company called Lyft. It's been gaining massive traction on Angel, uh, Angel List, right? So that basically is saying we track, we help you track uh, your activity and sort of complete your assignment. So everything to do with personal data, that's a huge opportunity. Hadoop as a service, that's an opportunity that I know of. Uh, and there are tools around Hadoop, that's an opportunity that people are doing. Like uh, I was at a convention like two months ago where uh, people are offering something as simple as a better compression service for your big data, right? So that's an option. Well, <clears throat> I've got easy ones and the obvious ones are obviously the data mining and analytics. But you know, uh, there is really no one big big data technology. So there is this exploding plethora of technologies. One opportunity could be how do you make provisioning the operations of these big data technologies easier? or orchestration between these technologies, either. that could be one. <coughs> but nobody's kind of got to that level yet. Yeah, I think uh, there's a, before we have startups on uh, big data, I think there's a lot of opportunity for just knowing big data and having more engineers, product managers, analysts who, uh, I, I don't want to use the term big data, but knowing and working with tools like Hadoop and so on. There's a company that's been bugging me for one and a half years to come and do some uh, work with them on Hadoop and so on. They've been unable to find anybody in India. It's a US company with an Indian office uh, based out of Pune. And uh, I, don't, I don't have time around a company now that has nothing to do with data. I don't have the time. And if you know Hadoop, I can connect you to them. But uh, there are a lot of, lot of these companies. Just try uploading a resume on Naukri. You just put the word Hadoop there. It's all automated in text search anyway. And see how many requests you get. Uh, it's just incredible how many people uh, think they need Hadoop at least, even if they really don't. But at least there's a lot of demand. You don't know how to, um, and so I'd say that is a prerequisite before we have startups uh, you know, working on this. We need more people that. So I will also answer this question because it's not. Different. So I think there is a the couple of ways to do it. Is that first what I would do is uh, I would look for the problems that these are solving, right? And you expect these problems to happen in other industries. There are tools, and I keep going back to Indeed. Uh, the reason is that um, let's say that. The jobs that stay in the, a lot of them that stay in the US are very high priced ones. If you go and do things like Big Data or Hadoop or Hive or you know uh, Mahout, any of these things, 
and then follow it with a qualification saying greater than hundred thousand dollars for a year. Okay. Uh, I was talking about business opportunity, not personal job. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay, that's fine. No, that's a good, uh, good question to ask. Is that the reason why I was saying is that that give you a list of companies that are looking for people. Okay, these are either product companies or you know companies that are trying to use this kind of stuff. And the reason uh, going back to business opportunities, um, I'm going to pause for a while and then I'll come back. I have to think about it a little bit in the sense that there is a one of the biggest problems I face when I was trying to decide either for me or for some of my customers whether we go to uh, EC2 for elastic, you know, for cloud computing, for example. When they produce a map produce service, that will I use it? Will I not use it? And lots of there is a lot of knowledge required. So, if you are not talking about a product company, it's a business service opportunities. I know a company, for example, in Chennai, that even before all this big data cloud happened, they specialize only in high performance computing. Their specialty is very simple. On Oracle and SQL Server, they will handle terabytes of data. They will build you solutions for. So, if you looking for niches, there are lots of things that you can you can find. I mean, I can't come up with a bunch of them right now, but it's a conversation that I'd love to have with you and you know, bring some some ideas on how to go and find them. Some other questions are there. Uh, my name is Kandik. Uh, I think uh, you know, decision making on uh, you know, what to, to, whether to use RDBMS or uh, you know, no, no SQL database. But I was just reading an article uh, that where we talked talk about RDBMS, you know, you should use it have an asset property. And suddenly it became a base you know, where you know even the consistency you can forego you know, uh, that became caps caps is actually a consistency availability and partition properties. And uh, I read about you know uh, Facebook uses Cassandra basically avoiding consistency and making sure only availability and the partition properties are there. Google uses IP tables which the reverse which actually you know forgoes availability and then you know, goes for consistency and uh, partition availability. But the question is, and, and they say even all three cannot coexist together. Correct. First of all, why is that? Okay, and your experience, your thoughts on that. So, I, I don't think they can coexist together. I don't think you can optimize for all. Right? They do coexist to some extent, right? You just can't optimize all three sort of corners of that triangle, which is can. Uh, so why can't you do that? Because think of it this way, right? Data, you know, what's the speed of replication? Speed of that. So if if I have to have availability, right? I can't have a single point of failure, right? If I can't have a single point of failure, it means I have to have one or two or more instances or something, right? If I have to have two or more instances or something which represent the same state all the time, that means they have to have data going back and forth between them. Right? Which means, regardless of how fast light travels, if you have enough volume in our scale, those two will never be the exact same at any given point in time. Right? So you violate consistency. So again, it's, it's based on the limitations that are there in, in the computational power, in the sort of network, in the way uh, sort of systems are built. Right? So, but they do exist together to some extent. It's just which form, which edge of it do you choose to do optimize? Right. That boils down to again, you know, whether you can work on uh, scale data and give approximate results. Correct. Rather than giving a. So, to give a background to everyone who probably doesn't know this, there's a theorem known as the CAP theorem, right? Or also known as the Brewer's theorem, which says that a distributed computing system cannot have consistency, availability, and partition dominance. It can only have either of these two. What are the last one? Partition tolerance. Partition tolerance. Right. So it means any distributed system that is there in the world right now uh, is generally said to have, as he rightly said, due to the limitations of computing, due to the limitations of the way things are designed, it could only have either consistency and availability or availability and partition tolerance, either of the two. You can't really try to have all of them at the same time. So you can architect systems that sort of eliminate uh, to a very very low percentile, but you still have uh, some trade-off, right? So I've seen this on Facebook. 
For example, if I travel to a new region and if I try to search some of my friends, they don't pop out the list for a while. And I suddenly think, did they unfriend me or block me or what? And then in the next couple of hours, I can find them back. So that's an example of your consistency missing. So Facebook deliberately probably designed that system saying it's okay to be eventually consistent. So Cassandra is one such database that emphasizes that saying, okay, I will give very high availability, I will give partition tolerance, that means I will always be up, all right, we will not go down as much as we can, we will try to remain up. And we will also have partition tolerance, that means if one of the partitions goes down, the other part of it will still be serving data, so there is uh, tolerance there. But consistency might not be there. So consistency means data might be eventually consistent. A while later you see the data, the correct data being updated, but it won't be there all the time. So most systems are designed around these two principles and every distributed system at some point will have uh, will have to bear with one of these uh, issues, you know. So we've, we've always had that issue in our system. Well. And we always try to keep reducing that, but you can't really block it up. Is that the main decision making factor? That is one of the, no, 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 that's definitely not the decision making factor to so what database or what uh, system you you use, that's not the primary decision. The primary decision boils down to what is the kind of data you have, what is your use case, what, are the, what is the amount of money that you have to spend on that, on that and, and so forth. So those are the top three criteria, but, uh, but every system architect who is experienced enough would understand that these are also constraints that you need to think about. So when you, the minute you start learning Cassandra, you will read that it's a one hash dynamic hash once uh, one half dynamic hash table and it will also tell you that it's eventually consistent. So some of the data, for example, if I'm looking at the same screen at the same time and there's a lot of hits, uh, data that user A updated might not be immediately visible for me. So that's how Cassandra operates because once you start clustering it, it will eventually make the data consistent. But the trade, that's the trade-off. The advantage is that it will have high amount of uptimes, really fast reads. You know, another advantage is that it has us as a software that we give it. So, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Shiva. One kind of question to Namjo. So, uh, during your presentation, you mentioned about you know uh, one of the things that for getting real time analytics, you the applications take care of splitting the data. That is the transaction part. Uh, from that, they also split the analytical part of the data. So, uh, I just don't understand more what you mentioned. So, you have a question for this learning maths Hi, hi. This is Sintel from uh, Congress and uh, High Performance Computing Center of Excellence. Uh, before asking a uh, particular technical question, I'd like to uh, add some points to what are the questions that they asked previous asked. Okay, and uh, Doray has asked about why can't we look at cloud solutions and other things before going into Hadoop. I mean, even Hadoop with the service has rightly pointed out, as it said, uh, Amazon provides and other provides. Okay, when you look at Hadoop, right? I mean, basically. You look at storage and computation. Okay, that should be happen in data local. That is the concept of Hadoop is all about ecosystem is all about data locality. The computation should occur where the storage is all about. You put your data in the cloud, and if you don't do it in the where the data occurs, lot of input network input output occurs. So that's where the performance goes down. If you look at the Hadoop solutions over the cloud, that's the one drawback that you got. EMR compared to internal Hadoop is very very performance wise believe me i have spoken with the emr guys they said performance lower compared to internal hadoop clusters that's a cloud solution based on hadoop is very slow that's one point and about uh, most of the discussion were about uh, no sql hadoop then you come out autonomous but no sql is also a part of hadoop that's one thing i want to make sure of hadoop is an ecosystem that Everything it contains. That to others who are uh, not working in uh, Hadoop, I'm telling you. That is, uh, Hadoop, is, Hadoop ecosystem consists of NoSQL, uh, then other, even if you want to connect with the SQL, uh, SQL services where you can connect with. That is, uh, depends upon the use case you work, you can have your services accordingly, whatever, uh, whatever you want to add on, like Solar, Lucene, what Java has added for document, especially for unstructured. Uh, data for semi-structure, 
data, all those things. That's the one part. And third part, whenever we talk with the customers, I mean, we are purely out of uh, center of excellence. We talk with the people, I mean, uh, from the outside cognizant, so the internal, inside cognizant. We talk about the the cost parameter and the number of data involved. You don't have to go to directly to big data or directly to Hadoop. That's the one thing. You have to think about the, what the cost parameter that you are going to use. Second thing, that you have to see how many records. You can scale it up. Like uh, what Asif has told, you can scale it up for terabytes of data. But the computation that you are going to do is going to be very costlier in terms of performance as well as the cost. That's the two points that I want to come back. Okay, I got a question for now. This is two. You have told me about, I mean, continuous updates is not possible with NoSQL combined with, I mean, NoSQL other than HBase combined with, uh, even HBase combined with Hadoop ecosystem, you can have continuous update, I mean, continuous update improvements. That's the one thing. And real time analytics, even that's contradicts with Asi. Asi has told, Asi has told about near real time analytics is possible using. Uh, Hadoop ecosystem, that's what he has been doing for uh, work. <coughs> so, firstly, my apology, those things weren't related, right? So, I thought, is this on? I thought the questions were actually related, sorry, they weren't, right? So, so I'll try to answer your question first, right? So what I said was not split, not, not the application splitting the transaction, right? But the way a business process can be designed, right? So you have the transactional part of the business process, and then you have the sort of fraud or risk or analytics scoring part of that transaction itself, right? So those are two different steps, two different tasks in the process, right? And we don't try to mix those two tasks in the same system. We do it actually in a different system. And the sort of risk or analytics scoring is more often a sort of data intensive application. Right? It uses all historic data for that account, all the transactions for that account in the past, right? to come up with a decision whether this transaction should be allowed or not. Right? The transactional part of the system does you know, debit and credit in the end at the simplest level. Right? So by splitting it up in terms of tasks that different applications have to perform, you actually have different use cases realized differently in those two applications. So you don't force sort of your analytics application to work the same way as your transaction applications. When we started out, we were doing it all in the same system. And even today, a large part of it is done in that OLTP system. But what we're doing is realizing that that's not a scalable way to do things. Right? We're actually moving it out into more of a data grid model where we actually have the analytics of OL OLAP type of use cases. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Right, now I'll try to get to yours. Right? So I guess since that question was pointed to me, I can take it. All right. So you said a lot of things, man. So I'll start with the last ones that I remember. Right? So, <laughs> so I think you said uh, sort of near real time analytics as you know being possible, certainly possible, right? But like I said, thirty seconds to start up that query in our proof uh, of concept, right? That's valid near real time for some folks, right? Fits the bill perfectly. For us, it didn't, right? So I'm not saying it's not possible. And even for sort of incremental updates and things like that, right? If you look at the way sort of uh, Hadoop has evolved, like I said, in the recent releases of Hadoop, it's certainly possible, right? When we did the proof of concept, it wasn't possible. Right? So the same thing goes for uh, so recently, if you've used, and I don't want to name the evil empire, but if you use Google search recently, you'll notice that it sort of reacts faster to you now, right? That's because of the evolution of that in incremental indexing as you're doing your search, right? So they move past sort of the base Hadoop that they started with to do static indexing and actually add incremental capabilities, right? They come up with a faster way to do the search. So what I'm what I'm saying is, in our use case, right, the the lag to actually feed the streaming data in, so we don't have a large log file sitting there that we actually trying to do analysis on. We have a stream of events that's coming, right? 
to try to stream that event in into a map reduce function, right? And then try to get real time analytics on it, meaning the map reduce is always running. I'm just giving it more and more and more input, right? So to get that first meaningful query started, it took 30 seconds. I stream 5 million more events into it in the next second. Guess what? It starts over again, right? So it didn't work for our use case. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. I'm not going to go to the first part because I forgot. And I don't know if you're willing to repeat <laughs> yourself or not, but that's my small <laughs> mind, right? <laughs> Anyone else want to come? Does Cognizant always talk about costs? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else at all that you guys do? <laughs> no, I was also an explorer kid. Okay. So we talk about technical issues and technology. Good, good. Just kidding. Next question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think just on the real time analytics part. Uh, so uh, Andrew was talking about. You know, map reduce not being scalable when you have a lot of streams coming in. Uh, there's been a lot of work in that space. A lot of people have realized that real time systems don't work with well. them. It's just two different things, two different problems. And Twitter has done some amazing work. Uh, they have something called a Twitter storm. You should probably look at that. That is the equivalent of Hadoop on the real time world. So, what it basically does is it does map reduce in a different way. You have clusters sitting and waiting for events. You just shard events in different categories or whatever and they just increment counters. <coughs> Real time analytics which are time series based more or less, you know, aggregate functions, some minimum or whatever, that's what I'm thinking. So I think uh, Twitter Storm is an equivalent in the real time space and you shouldn't really be saying to put try to put everything in Hadoop, that's not the way to do it. We are working on that problem. And other system is not only like Hadoop, when you talk about big data, a lot of other uh, big data platforms are example HPCC that is a one more uh, big data platform where we are also working upon to analyze how we compass to other big data platforms. There is one more. When you talk about data, as you rightly pointed out, you do not go exactly with where Hadoop alone. A lot of other vendors uh, are available. Any other questions? Okay. Are there other questions? <coughs> it is on time. Uh, <coughs> one more question. See, two years Question or statement? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. We'll get into it. Okay. Two years back. Two years back, when I joined Honestcape, it was all about the hype about uh, cloud, cloud, everything. Right now, it's all about big data. So, what is after two years? What do you see uh, after two years? <laughs> Especially to our <athletes. laughs> Who wants to be? I think you asked the question to ask <laughs> I don't think it's just hype. Maybe we are not actually using some of those apps and we don't tend to see uh, what is really happening, right? Like I don't know how many of you are actually using Amazon Cloud. If you do use it, you'll realize it's pretty powerful, right? You can spin up instances, additional computing power. You couldn't do that earlier at all. And uh, the same way on big data as well, if you actually land up with massive amounts of data which is increasing by the hour to insane levels, then you really need good technologies. And big data is just a, probably an analyst point term, but to us it's very about you know, very, very large data sets that are not, uh, that can't be processed through the usual ways. So the whole big data hype as you may call it is basically a movement to try to figure out you know, so it's not very really hype, and I don't know what's after two years. You know, maybe Microsoft Surface or something like that. <laughs> See, there's uh, one. There's one very interesting article I read uh, two days back. It said that you know recently they discovered the Higgs boson particle, right, in CERN. So they said the title was "Big Data Meets Big Bang." Right? So, <laughs> And it took them like 50 years of research to actually, I mean, they've been doing this analysis for a long time. But I think there's definitely value in trying to speed in up the research and the correlation result. In fact, uh, one of the data points they said was they generate something like, you know, 100 uh, petabytes of data, and which is scattered over like 150 data centers, 150,000 processors, and so on. So, 
So that's definitely a, a real element to it, but that's also a hype. So it, uh, I mean, there will be opportunities that are real, but then that will be determined by the real pain points, real use cases, rather than just latching onto the technology work and then the use case. So instead of thinking framework and technology first, think the use case first. This is what my uh, point of view is. Yeah, so I think one thing that's really uh, starting to show up a lot uh, is uh, big data married with big compute. So if you saw the recent launch of Google's compute engine, they demoed how uh, they were able to spin up 600,000 cores and then do cancer research like in, in seconds, what used to take weeks and weeks, right, because you're working a lot of data. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. You have companies that are uh, coming up that can uh, speed up cancer research, uh, genomic research, uh, particle physics, uh, data analysis uh, type things. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. But I think there's also a lot of, uh, at, at least in, in the non-high computation uh, world, uh, you, you, you have a lot of people who, have, who know they have a big data problem and then they're starting to use tools. Then you have people who think they have a big data problem and then they actually don't and they end up choosing the wrong tools. So I think in two years you'll also see a lot more clarity around when to go in for or what's the right tool for which job and you'll have a lot more documented case studies and so on just a lot more to do than was in 2010 when we started up. So one way trick between, to say between high versus reality is to watch the applications. You don't just listen to what vendors say. I don't even want to pay attention to what the analysts predict kind of thing, right? Because two, three years later, the prediction may be something entirely different. But if you watch applications being built and being used successful applications being built and being talked about, you can separate out the, what is the reality and what, what is the other, you know, the high portion versus the reality portion. Um, any other questions? <laughs> so just to add one thing to that, right? If you think, uh, sort of look at the past and think, why big data actually came up as a problem, right? So we've had the internet for many years, not counting when the defense actually, sort of defense department actually controlled it, but as users using the internet, how many years now? 15 years, right? How long ago did big data actually start becoming visible? Two years, three years, right? Something like that. So why did they suddenly start becoming visible? Because you have a lot of influx of user-facing applications, right? And the things that people wanted to do with data that was being collected from these users, right? So if you look, if you want to see what's coming up, and I think you're from your question, right? So Amazon uh, sort of cloud and big data, in my mind, are not directly related, right? So if you want to sort of have a crystal ball and look into the future, right? We got to see what kind of sort of applications are going to come up, right? So I so recently attended a known physicist, uh, Aoki, Dr. I'm so sorry, I forget his name, right? But he's a futurist, right? He's a physicist and he's a futurist. And uh, he thinks that the world is going towards ubiquitous computing capability, right? Ubiquitous connectivity, not just carrying my iPhone around, just going up to the wall and saying, you know, I want to order coffee, right? Going to a curtain and saying, oh yeah, I like that car that's standing outside. I want to know all the specs in that car that I can see through my window and I want to see them on my window, right? But I want to even order that car and buy it and have it sent to me. Like standing at my window without pulling out a single device. So everything around you becomes a device. Right? Now that may be, you know, 50 years down the road. I don't know if it's even going to be reality. But I guess what you have to look at is what kind of applications are coming up. And what are some of the problems that are now just beginning to raise their head from those applications, right? So if you look at sort of you know, India, right? 400, 500 million mobile devices, right? Very few of them smartphones. But even now, you run into bandwidth limitations, right? So it's maybe something completely unrelated to data for all I know, right? But the only way to sort of foresee and guess is to look at the kind of applications that are coming out and the problems that are coming up with those applications, right? And that might tell you what's going to happen in the future as a big trend. Sorry, any material you can come on. Okay. One other thing, uh, interesting story actually. The other reason why big data has become so popular is it's kind of within the reach 
of it's basically written to each not only from a technology's point of view but also from a cost point of view. So you can actually run all these computation algorithms on cheap hardware, right? So that's one of the things that makes it uh, possible. So the story is actually like 50 years back, my dad used to run some, he's an engineer, he was an engineer, so he used to run some engineering problems and they were actually complex design problems and they used to do it on punch cards and used to travel from Delhi to Kanpur where IIT Kanpur had the super machine where they could run it on, right? So think of it today, you really don't have to go through so much difficulty to find a system to run these problems on. The technology and the, the means are much within, uh, you know, it's within striking distance, right? Within accessible limits to everybody. And that's what makes it possible. Right? I just want to give some uh, application or we get a quickly, you know, two, three things. Uh, there's a company called IPM Web that I know of. So what they do is they take a data model every hour and they do some modeling, statistical modeling. And they come back and tell us, hey, this is uh, has a higher probability of a peak. And they charge a cool four, five thousand dollars a month for a simple service, right? So you just, that's a sample data opportunity. Uh, I was reading some article about police, how they are basically putting all the crime patterns into databases and doing analysis and coming up with hotspots where crime would possibly come up. That is a great opportunity. Uh, big data is big in advertising. So advertising, I would probably say, is one of the big users of big data, not the biggest. Uh, I think Facebook is using a lot of data. Your own uh, data is called is the open graph, right? So basically, they're crunching that data, they're trying to figure out and pretty soon Facebook will launch, uh, you know, an ad network on mobile and f online, which would basically advertise about advertise to you about what they know about you, or right? onto the third-party sites where you sit, right? So if you just like Nike today, you would probably get a Nike shoe ad, uh, you know, on several sites that you sit. Right? That requires big data. So there are a lot of interesting opportunities. You have to go out there, see what's available, and kind of uh, get into it and. You know, take the best, I mean, uh, take advantage of it. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Is the last one? Shall we take the last question? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, no, I don't need the mic. Just saying material. Post online. Oh. Maybe you can take. Yeah, no, I, uh, no, I won't ask this. <laughs> Um, I think we got a lot of good information. First of all, let us thank the panelists for your time. And let's thank the Hasby team for actually making it happen here. Thanks a lot, guys. So I want to do a small pitch, uh, not for myself, but how many of you know that we have a tech community in Chennai called Chennai Geeks? Okay. For the, all the others who do not know, we are on Facebook, it's called Chennai Geeks, just go and search for it. You can join the group, we meet once a month, uh, it varies, sometimes third week, sometimes fourth week, uh, and we talk about topics like this. And we are open to you know coming up with a variety of topics and talking about it. It will be really great to have participation uh, from all of you, because I think many of these things, learning takes place when you, know, when you start listening to the real stories and what is happening and how it is being used uh, you know and even new technologies do they make sense do you want to go after them and stuff like that um, and i think it's it's time that we had a big tech community and just to give a small metric uh, before we started chennai geeks a few of us uh, i i was in you know living in the valley for some time and there's they have something called a software development forum they had, at the time I left, somewhere around 2007, they had 17 special interest groups. And each group would meet at least on one day. So you can go to the Bay Area on any day of the week. And evening you can land up in some technology talk. They don't know, I mean, Americans don't do anything on Friday evenings, technical. So, you know, so it's on Monday through Thursday. And sometimes there will be overlapping groups, whether it's mobile, with the scalability and modeling, SIG and that kind of stuff. I am hoping that we can at least come up with a whole bunch of special interest groups as part of the Chennai Geeks. So please, please come and join. And uh, I, you know, Vijay, really thanks for you know making this happen here. And uh, we keep coming back to the Startup Center all the time. And so 
In case nobody noticed, he is Vijay and he is the guy you know, who runs the Startup Center. Hey.